Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study at Trinity Baptist Church. Good place to be to come out of the rain, isn't it? Welcome to you that are turning in on Facebook Live. Hope you got all your snacks ready because we're ready to go. <laughs> all right. Uh, just want to make one announcement uh, before we get started. We had a prayer request for Dina Ashcraft's brother, and uh, I understand he passed yesterday. So be in prayer for uh, that family, the family of Norman, her brother, and for Dina and her family as well. Uh, we're going to get started this evening. We're going to be looking at one verse in 1 John chapter 4. It'll be verse 18. We're going to read a verse to get started, and we'll read the following verse. Stand with me, if you would, for uh, the reading of God's Word. We're going to read at 1 John 4, verse 17. 18 will be our text verse for this evening. Verse 17 says, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Father, we do thank you for your great love for us. We thank you that you loved us even though we consider ourselves many times, maybe most of the time, unlovable. And Father, we just thank you for that, that great sacrificial gift of love, your Son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we ask, Lord, that you would bring your word to bear on our thoughts, and our lives. Show us that which we need to reject. Show us truth, Lord, that we might embrace it. For Jesus' sake and for your glory, we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. In, in 1 John, in this epistle of John, John uses different words and sort of uh, emphasizes them and stays with them in each of the chapters of 1 John. Uh, and he uses words that are indications or indicators of the spiritual condition of the reader. In the first chapter of uh, 1 John, John uses the words light, and fellowship. He uses those as spiritual indicators. When I say spiritual indicators, if I was to say that in bus language, that means are you saved or are you lost? Are you going to heaven or is there a chance that you might be going to hell? Are you living for the Lord or are you living for yourself? If you're saved, you'll have technical meltdown sometimes. <laughs> if you're saved, you're going to have a desire for fellowship with the Lord and with his people. Now, you may say, well, what if, what if God's people don't want to have fellowship with me? That might be an indicator of your spiritual condition. Check yourself out. If you're saved, you're going to walk in the light. You don't have to worry about covering up what you say or hiding what you do. I would say you're going to live a transparent lifestyle. Now, I'm not talking about transparency like we hear our politicians talk about. If that's the kind of transparency you have in your life, you're going to want to put a mask on and just keep it on the whole time, okay? Now, in chapter 2, John uses the word abide or abiding. 
if you abide in him and he abides in you, that's a good indication that you're a child of God, a saved, born again, washed in the blood believer in Jesus Christ. The Strong's Concordance, if you were to look that, that, uh, that word up, abide, uses the word sojourn, tarry, continue. That's the definition that it uses. When I think of abide, I think of living where life is. If I'm abiding or living in Christ, brothers and sisters, that's where eternal life is. If Jesus is abiding in me, if he's in, abiding in you, that's eternal life. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Now, John uses the word love three times in two verses in the second chapter of his epistle one. Let's look at uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 5 for just a moment. 1 John chapter 2, verse 5. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily, is the love of God perfected. We're going to look at that word perfected. It's in our text verse that we read. Hereby know we that we are in him. But whoso keepeth his word? There's a qualification there, of course. And this same perfection is a reference that we read in verse 18. Chapter 3 uses the word love seven times. John establishes that love will be the nature of the Christian. It's an indicator that he has the nature of God dwelling in him because God is love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is a familiar chapter if you've read your Bible very much. Uh, in, uh, it's known as the love chapter. Paul mentions love or charity nine times in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In chapter 4 of 1 John, John uses the word love 21 times in his epistle. Three times alone in our text verse 18. John says there is no fear in love. That's quite a statement, isn't it? There's no fear in love. Why can John say with complete confidence that there is no fear in love? Because John knew love. John had a personal relationship with love. John lived with love every day for three years. John had laid his head on the breast of love. John knew the reality of the scripture that says, Greater love hath no man than this, than he laid down his life for his friend. Yes, John knew love. Love incarnate. Emmanuel. God or love with us. Now, in 1 John 4, look at verse 16. 1 John 4.16 says, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. That's key. That's something we need to remember. That's, neat. That's something that, that we should probably read or tell ourselves every day. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. He goes on in verse 18 to say there is no fear in love. There no, is no fear in God because God is love. Think about this for a moment. Does God ever fear? Is God ever in dread of Satan's devices? 
Satan has no new top secret cutting edge stealth weapons of mass destruction. Satan employs the same old tired worn out means of warfare that he has always used. Lies and deceit. Yep. The sad truth is, man keeps falling for the same old worn out dusty tricks, doesn't he? Generation after generation, Satan tempts man with that same forbidden fruit of man's wants and his desires. I've got to have it. Do we think for a moment that man's capricious, vacillating, half-hearted obedience is any mystery to God? No, of course not. For that which is created is never a surprise or impediment to the perfect will of the Creator. Satan's rebellion was no terror to God, for God knew of Satan's plans before he ever created him. God does not fear that he's losing his ability to save mankind, for we learned in a previous lesson that the power of the Godhead is eternal, as is his love. There's no fear in love, for God's love is perfect. You say, well, that may be so, but I'm not God. There are plenty of things that I'm scared of. I'm reminded of the guy that proclaimed, I'm, I don't even believe in ghosts, but I'm afraid of them. <laughs> Remember, these verses are an indicator. They're a gauge. They're something to help us see where we're at. An indicator of the salvation of God. We read in this verse, 18, fear hath torment. Torment is referring to a fear of judgment. Now, the child of God need not ever fear judgment or punishment. Why is that? You say, because I'm saved. Because I'm perfect in Christ, in Christ Jesus. You may think, well, I'm saved, but I'm not perfect. But God says you are. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to look at uh, verse 12. And we'll read through verse 14. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, the 12th verse that starts out, But this man. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected, how long? Forever, them that are sanctified. Not only does God say you're perfect, he says you're perfect forever. Wow, that's big. Matthew 5.48, Jesus says, Be ye perfect, even as your Father which in heaven is perfect. Turn back to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Look at verse 12. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. What about, what about the saved man that doubts his salvation? No, I know you've never doubted your salvation, but I know I have, especially when I first got saved. Fear hath torment. The saved man that doubts his salvation finds no joy in the eternal. For them, the eternal can become a dread of never-ending punishment. 
Any Christian that fears judgment has no sure assurance of salvation. Why would he ever tell anyone about the saving love of the Lord Jesus Christ if he's not even sure he saved himself? He that feareth, the verse says, is not made perfect in love because fear hath torment. That doesn't mean they're not saved. It just says that they're not made perfect. They have that torment. Fear and love cannot occupy the same space. They are mutually exclusive. Turn in your Bibles, if you would. We're going to look at an example of this truth in 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Here we're going to see the recounting of the epic battle between my favorite David and Goliath. Goliath was the champion of the Philistines, David the shepherd boy. David was the musician, Goliath the man of war, David the psalmist, Goliath the blasphemer of God. Let's look at verse 1, chapter 17, and we're going to read down to 10. Starts out, now the Philistines, 1 Samuel 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, which belonged to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah in the Ephesadim. <laughs> Verse 2, and Saul, the men of Israel, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span, and he had a helmet of brass upon his head and was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants of Saul? To Saul, choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If ye be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, I, if I prevail, and kill him, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Verse 10. I defy the armies of Israel this day. What is Goliath saying? He's saying, you're chicken. You're yellow. He's goading them. He's trying to get someone to lose their temper and come out and fight him. I dare you to come out and fight me. But he was saying more than that. He was belittling God's people, Israel. Goliath was actually spitting in the face of God. Big mistake. Look at verse 10 again with 11. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul... That's the king, and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine. They were dismayed and greatly afraid. 
for 40 days, this was the stage that was set between God's people and their enemies, the Philistines. In action, failing to act can have a multiplying effect when it comes to fear. We might fear doing something, but oftentimes the doing of it many times can erase that fear. Failing to act, letting fear build up in our hearts and minds can build a wall that becomes impossible to see over. For 40 days, this monster has come out with his threatenings, and by this time, when he walked out, they could feel the ground shake when he walked. And when he bellowed his accusations, it was as if he blew with his putrid breath rancor over the valley, reaching to the other side where they huddled in fear. It seems as if even the creatures could sense some impending doom, for the fowls of the air, the buzzards, would circle overhead when Goliath came to issue his challenge. Who should have gone out? Surely there was a man of great stature in the army of Israel. It seems as though the king, King Saul, was said to have stood head and shoulders above most of the other men in Israel. Should he have gone out to fight this giant? Saul was so far from God, he needed music therapy to keep from losing his mind. Israel, to a man, knew that to go to answer the challenge of Goliath of Gath was certain death. There was no chance of survival. The daily skirmishes they had between the two armies proved how effective Goliath's rannings were. It's thought that Israel might have had the superior force, but they had no spirit to push the Philistines from their land. Where was their hope? Was there a deliverer? Would God raise up a champion? You know, I'm reminded of Elijah. He thought he was the last man standing. Elijah thought all of Israel had forsaken the Lord and that he was the last man, the last bastion of faith, and he was ready to perish and give up the ghost. When everyone gives in to fear and despair and expects the worst, when all hope is seemingly gone, never forget, there's always a remnant. God always has an answer. Think about it. Do you think these men ever imagined God would send a shepherd boy with a sling to deliver them? Certainly, David would have been the best slingsman of Sherwood Forest. David certainly rivaled Davy Crockett, who killed a bar when he was only three. So the song goes, David killed a lion and a bear. Yeah, he was older than three. David most likely honed his skills to where he could split a hair at 50 yards while he was watching those sheep on the Judean hillsides. But is that why David was different than the rest of Saul's army? Remember, David mentions to Saul that he had slain a bear and a lion. Have you ever wondered how David killed that bear and lion? Let's look at verse 33 quickly. Chapter 17, verse 33. We're going to read down through 37. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said to Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, 
and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. David never mentions in his discussion of the bear and the lion with King Saul of using a sling. I think it's for a reason. The only reason he ever mentions the bear and the lion is to convince, to convince Saul to let him have a chance to fight Goliath. David intimates that although Goliath may be fearsome, he's no more terrible <clears throat> than a raging lion or a bear, and he'll come to the same end. How can David have such confidence David said he's defied the armies of the living God. David knew it was God that had delivered the lion and the bear into his hand. Why would Goliath be any different? Now, we know as mortals there are things that we should fear. We know that some fear is healthy. Don't stick your hand in a fire. <clears throat> the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. There's a fear of what people think about you. That may be good, and then on the other hand, it may not be. Depends. The fear of failure often keeps people from even trying. Fear of death and dying is what Israel was facing, and that same fear has crippled over half of the world's population today. We know that there are those who seem to be the brave ones. David seems very brave. But we cannot forget Daniel, who was cast into the pit to spend the night with ravenous lions. He made them his pillow. A fiery furnace proved to be no terror, to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah when they refused to bow to the golden statue of the king. Now, unlike David and Daniel, who never seemed to doubt God's deliverance, these three friends recognized the reality of their situation. Listen to their testimony. They say, Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, if it be so... Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace and will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it, unto, be it known unto you, to thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. These friends say, if you throw us in that burning furnace, will not bow the knee to you or your gods. And if it served God's purpose for us to burn, let God be God, we will stay in his perfect will. Talk about bravery. God has seen fit during, do, uh, in these accounts of these three men, plus David and Daniel, he never mentions the word fear concerning any of them. These Old Testament pillars of faith seemingly were fearless. When trying to explain heroic actions concerning acts of bravery, we've all heard the same explanation designed to maybe be a little politically correct to avoid offending anyone, it goes something like this. Heroic acts take place when a man acts in spite of his fear. We're all afraid if we have good sense, they say. And there's a hero 
somewhere inside of each one of us. We just have to figure out how to get him on the outside. Now, I think that explanation is as good as any if you want to eliminate God from the equation. And, of course, we know the world has done a pretty good job of that. Even some believers inadvertently, possibly, eliminate God from the equation by saying, we don't need to read the Old Testament. It has no value in our modern society. It's archaic. The Old Testament, brothers and sisters, is just as important as the New Testament because it is the Word of God. The Old Testament can help us see and understand the message of the New Testament with additional clarity. I like the description that I I heard from one of the first times I came to Trinity Baptist Church. The Old Testament is a canvas or a painting that pictures or illustrates New Testament truths. So... What New Testament truth does David illustrate in his epic battle with Goliath? Let's listen to David as he addresses the problem with that giant Philistine. David has arrived on a day just as the two armies start down into the valley to do battle with each other. David is able to find his brother's unit and his three brothers just as Goliath rises up to issue his daily challenge. When Goliath's voice roared over their heads, they all retreated and fled, for they were afraid. After they retired to their camp, some of the soldiers in in David's brother's unit asked David, Did you see him? Did you see the giant? He comes up every day to defile Israel. They told him the reward for the man that would kill Goliath. Look at verse 26. We see David's response. uh, Chapter 17, verse 26. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be to the man that killeth this Philistine? And taketh away the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Do we detect any sign of fear there? David's oldest brother, Eliab, hears David and is greatly irritated by David's exchange with the other soldiers. In effect, Eliab says to David, Hey, kid, all right, you've seen the battle. You've seen the giant. Now get out of here and go home and watch father's sheep. Look at David's response to his brother in verse 29. And David said, What have I done? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? That's a question that we can ask ourselves as well. Look at verse 32, when David was taken before King Saul. Verse 32 says, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail him because, fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Do you detect any fear there? After David tries on Saul's armor and takes it off, he goes out to face Goliath. We remember how disgusted Goliath is when he sees who has come out to fight him. Goliath says, Am I a dog that you send out this boy with a stick? Says Staves in the Bible. Come on, fight me! The buzzards are hungry and I'll feed them your guts. The Bible doesn't say that, does it? What does it say? Look at verse 43. Verse 43 we read, 
And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Now, does God record, does God repeat the curses that Goliath spewed? He doesn't, re- he doesn't record those. I imagine they were probably fairly disgusting. Look at verse 44. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Not quite as colorful or as coarse as what I said. So what's the point? God, the Holy Spirit, never needs to offend our sensibilities to get his point across. If we are to be offended by the word of God, let it be the length, width, depth, the gravity that the Bible exposes of our own sins. This book is pure and holy. It needs no coarse language, for it is the word of God, and God is love. Now, listen to David. See if you detect any fear. Look at verse 45. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beast of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Any fear? Not a bit. Was God calling David through these circumstances that he had witnessed at the battlefield? No doubt this was the focal point of David's training on those Judean hillsides while tending his father's sheep. Remember, it was just David and the Lord and an army of sheep. Almost prophetic, isn't it? When I rehearse in my mind David's response, is there not a cause? I'm reminded of Samuel when the Lord calls him. What was Samuel's response? Here am I. Three times the Lord called Samuel, and three times Samuel responded, Here am I. Remember Isaiah's response to the Lord? Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, and we're going to look at the first eight verses of Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah, the sixth chapter, the first verse starts out, In the year that King Uzziah died. Isaiah 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I, this is Isaiah talking, saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, Each one had six wings, with twain, two, he covered his face, and with twain, two, he covered his feet, and with twain, two, he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the posts of the doors moved. I imagine they shook. They moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Verse 5. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When you see Jesus, you see yourself as you really are. 
Verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Verse 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. Turn back to 1 John chapter 4. In verse 18, we read, and we'll read again, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. Does this mean that we will never, ever fear? I don't think so. Think about God's love for a moment. Perfect love casteth out fear. God is love. His love is perfect because he is perfect. He's God and he's love. Brothers and sisters, love created us. We were created by love. Created by love to be loved by God. We were created by love so that we might love others with the same godly love that God loves us. Ponder this statement. What could I do? Is there anything I can do? What should I do to get God to love me? Or to get God to love me more? When we understand the answer to that question, we're close to understanding God's love. You see, there is nothing that we can do to get God to love us or to even love us more. We tend to think we can do this or we can stop doing that and it will merit God's love. I like what I heard one preacher say, God can never be more than he is. God is love. And there are no boundaries that set any limits on God's love. Turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 3. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3, we read, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. God loves us from eternity past, to eternity future, so there is no beginning or end to his love for us. He loved us before we were ever created, so there's nothing we could ever do to earn his love. But more than everlasting love, there are no limits or no boundaries to his love. God placed all his love all that he is, all his love on us before we were ever born. And then you get born again and he places that love, all that he is, all of it inside of you. Wow. We like it when we tell someone that we love them and they respond back. I love you too. 
But it's easy to say, I love you, isn't it? God has given us a certain way for us to respond to his love. To respond to his never-ending, no limits, perfect love that casts out fear. Now, it's not a way that God uses so he can tell how much we love him. He already knows. He already knows how much we love him. He's God. God has given us a way to measure our understanding of how much God loves us by our response to his love. It's not complicated. It's not a theological formula. Jesus uses seven words to tell us how we can measure our love for God. Turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 15. John chapter 14, 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. God has equipped each one of us with his perfect love. Our understanding and embracing of that love is a determining factor in our response to God's love for us. God asked Isaiah 2,700 years ago, whom shall I send and who will go for us? God's question still stands today for those that have ears to hear. Listen, for God speaks, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Is there not a cause? Do people still die lost and go to hell? Do we have friends and loved ones that are one step from the fires of eternal damnation? Is there not a cause we must embrace God's perfect love to cast out all fear. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. How shall we respond to God's love? Is there not a cause? How many times have you prayed? Here am I, send me. Don't stop. Don't forget who it is that sends us. And he sends us with his perfect love. Father, we do thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for that love that has no ends, no boundaries, no limitations. And you've given it to us by your grace. And we pray that it will continue forever as you have promised. You said it's an everlasting love, and we thank you for it. Lord, let us understand the magnitude. Let us understand the height and depth of your love. Let us understand that that perfect love replaces fear. We know that a lot depends on us who know the truth. We thank you for your truth. Your word is truth. We thank you for that precious blood that cleanseth from all sin. We praise you for Jesus' sake and in his name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for coming. Just a couple quick announcements. We are having our missions auction Wednesday, October 20th. Continue making your craft items or buy items for the missionary auction. The Sunday school classes are asked to make a basket. This is always a great time of fellowship. It's a fun time. It's a lighthearted time. But it's a needful time, and it goes for a good cause, our missionaries. The main speaker at our conference this year will be Pastor Mike Frazier. And the the losses are a family that will be here. They're missionaries to France and the Fall Day family to Haiti. So look forward to that. Be in prayer for Ron Dorman, who is uh, 
I don't know if he's in the hospital, but he's, he has COVID. I pray he's recovering. Pray for his recovery. Don't forget to pray for the Ashcraft family. And uh, remember this. God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's given us a sound mind. Well, to make good decisions, we need to be tolerant of those that are afraid. We need to be wise in how we conduct ourselves. And we need to pray, most of all, that God will give us the wisdom to make the right decisions concerning many things that we'll be faced with in the coming days and months and years. Ask for God to give you that understanding, that sense of truth. Father, we thank you for your love and your goodness. We thank you that you are the author of truth. We know that if something lines up with your word, we're pretty safe. But if it doesn't, we need to reject it. We need to treat it as though it's a lie. We thank you for the truth of the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you all for coming.